Tonight, uh, we would like to open our Bibles to Genesis chapter number 22. And previously, we've been preaching some on Sunday nights with different Bible pairs. We preached some about Abraham, and we started off with Abraham and Lot. And I preached some about letting go of Lot. And then last week, we dealt with kicking out Ishmael. This week, in Genesis chapter 22, we're going to come to the place where we deal with Isaac and Abraham sacrificing Isaac. So Genesis chapter number 22, look down if you will in verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took of the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son, and took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord shall it be seen. Now you'll notice in verse number one a phrase that seems to be confusing at first in light of some of the New Testament verses. You'll notice it says it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And the verse I'm making reference to is in James chapter number one. The Bible says God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. You say, well, what's the... The answer to this, is the Bible wrong? Of course not. The Bible is never wrong. We understand from Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 17, when the Bible recounts this story, the scripture says, when Abraham was tried, he offered up his son. So the word tempt here in Genesis chapter 22 can mean tried. Obviously, temptation can be used in two different ways. You can either be tempted to sin, or you can be tempted by way of a trial and trouble and tribulation or test that God has put into your life. That is considered a temptation. And so there's no contradiction at all. Really what I want to get to, though, here in the passage, and I think it's very fitting in this crisis that we're in, dealing with the strange circumstances that we're dealing with, you'll notice down in verse number 5, Abraham makes this comment to the servants. Look in verse 5. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. There are two words in this chapter that appear for the first time. We know when we study the Bible, we want to pay attention to the law of first mention, and Genesis has a lot of those first mentions. We know that the word love appears for the first time in verse number 2, and that refers to Abraham's love for his son, a father's love for his son. And then we notice that this word in verse number 5, worship, appears for the first time. And so what is worship? Especially 
in this crisis that we find ourselves in. Some people think there's no way I can worship God because of this health concern now. We can't assemble in groups and gather in a church building so I can't worship God. Let me go ahead and clear something up for you. This building here is not holy. There's nothing in the rocks and in the sheetrock and in the carpet and in the pulpit and the wood that is considered quote-unquote holy. We are not in the Old Testament. We are in the New Testament where the Bible says your body, if you're saved, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which you have of God. If you want something holy, you find the body of Christ which are believers. That's where God dwells. God does not dwell in this structure. You say, well, I can't worship God unless I come to a building. We're not in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, that was true. The Old Testament Jews had a certain locale. They had a certain place uh, in, uh, in situation in Jerusalem that they had to come certain times of the year to worship God. That's not the New Testament. Uh, you say, well, I can't worship because I can't come and see the preacher. Well, you're not coming to worship me anyway. You say, well, I can't confess my sins. You're not coming to a Baptist church, at least as far as I know yet, where you're coming to confess your sins to a man. You're supposed to confess your sins to God. The Bible says if we confess our sins, 1 John chapter 1, confess your sins to who? To Him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You're not going to find any holy water in a church like in the Old Testament times. This baptistry here, the water comes from the city sewer system and, and the water works here in town. That water is not holy. Now praying, I will give you this, we come together and we pray. We can worship when we pray together. That's corporate worship. I'm not saying we do not worship God when we assemble together and come to church. I'm not suggesting that at all. As a matter of fact, Psalm 66 verse 4 says this, All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. When we come in and we take the hymn book and we sing songs about Jesus and some of the hymns actually are like prayers and we sing to him, that is indeed a form of worship. I'm not saying we do not worship God when we come to church, but we know Isaac and Abraham, as far as we know from the text, they're not singing hymns. So what is true worship? In John 4, verse number 24, Jesus says to the woman, of Samaria, he says, if you worship God, you must worship God in spirit and in truth. There are many people all across this world that are worshiping what they think is God and they don't even have the truth. If you don't have the truth, you might be sincere and you might have a form of religion, but you're not worshiping God. You might have emotionalism, you might have a feeling, but you don't have the facts. And so, therefore, we need to understand, especially in this day and age, and what we're dealing with where we can't assemble at church together, how can I worship God, preacher? I can't come to church. Now, here's what you want to understand. When you come to church, there's more than taking place than just worshiping God. Although, like I will concede, we do worship God when we come to church. I'm not taking away from that. But that is not the only place. And by the way, if you think coming to church is the only time you can worship God, you are mistaken and you're missing out on what God wants you to do in your Christian life. We come to church, there's a lot more going on. When we come to church, we feed on the Word of God. We feed on the Word of God. We have messages. We have Bible studies. We feed and feast on the Word of God. We also fellowship one with another. We talk to one another. We have prayer requests. Sometimes we have testimonies where we fellowship together. Sometimes we're good Baptists. We actually eat. And we have some good food and fellowship. You also build up your faith when you come to church because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But we're dealing here in Genesis 22 with worship, and it deals with not faith and feeding. It deals with forfeiting something, sacrifice. So I want to submit to you that true worship is wrapped up in the word sacrifice. Now, God is not asking Abraham for his servant Eliezer. 
You read later on about his servant Eliezer back in, in, over in chapter 24 when he goes to get a bride for his Isaac. He's not, for, for his son Isaac, he's not asking for his servant. He's not asking for his nephew Lot, and he's not asking for his firstborn son Ishmael. He's asking here for Isaac. You say, who's Isaac? Isaac is the son of Abraham's heart. Isaac is the son of promise. He had to let go of Lot and he had to kick out Ishmael, but now he's coming to the place where God is asking him to sacrifice that thing and that one person he loves above all else. The first time the word love appears, it refers here to Abraham's love for his son Isaac. I believe Abraham started to love Isaac even before Isaac was born. And as the years pass and as his son grew up here, um, more than likely Isaac is a young man at this point. And as those years grew on and Isaac grew up, Abraham's love for him increased. He realized this is the heir of promise. This is that boy that God told me he's going to have sons and they're going to have sons and it's going to be an entire innumerable nation with God's blessing. This is my heir. He was living out his life like many parents do on the ball field sometimes in their kids. He was fulfilling his dreams through his son's eyes. And Abraham had to choose between Isaac and God. A.W. Tozer, the old preacher, said this, Things have become necessary to us. Boy, is that not ever true, especially in what we're dealing with now. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God. And the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution. He says over there in Samuel, it is not God, or I should correct myself, the minor prophets, I believe it's Hosea. He says, it is not God. And when you run the reference to Samuel, they bring out the Ark of the Covenant that it may save us from our enemies, Israel says. It is not God. This church building is not God. And if you can't carry on as a Christian just because we can't assemble on Sundays and gather together, there's something lacking in your faith. And I want to encourage you along this idea of true worship. You need to know what true worship is. You should be worshiping God not just on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, but you should worship God on Tuesday and on Monday and on Thursday and on Saturday and on Friday. We should worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not just some church thing, some form of religion where you walk in and all of a sudden this halo pops on your head. Some of you are having a hard time when you come in to get your halo in over your horns. It's a crazy thing in our culture and society today where people think just because they come to church they've done God a favor. They blow God a Sunday morning kiss and now they want God to leave them alone the rest of the week and they'll live just like they want to live, live like hell and then walk in on church and say they worship God. They did God a favor. You didn't do God a favor. When you come in church you get some preaching, you get some teaching and hopefully God the Holy Spirit rings your bell and gives you something to help you go out into this world and worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, A.B. Simpson said this, similar to Tozer, Once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is His Word. Once the gift I long for, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, now Himself alone. We've got to get to the place where it's not about the religion but it's about the relationship. Why do you read the Bible just to check it off every day? Why do you come to church just to say you came to church? It should lead you to worship God. You say, how do I know if I'm really worshiping God? Where's your Isaac? Is your Isaac on the altar? If your Isaac is not on the altar, I doubt that you are worshiping God. If you are going to move forward in your Christian life, this is a great thing for us because we have to really see 
how serious we are in our faith. Are we going to take the baby steps and say, you know, I'm not being spoon-fed anymore. I may have to read my Bible on my own. I may actually have to get my kids around and actually pray with them and, and hopefully point them to God so they can realize there is a God, not just because we load up and go to church on Sunday morning. Sometimes the only thing that kids realize, the only time they realize there's a God in their life is when they pile in the car and come to church. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. If you're going to move forward in your Christian life, it's inevitable you're going to come to a place where you've got to get rid of, you've got to rather sacrifice Isaac. But notice in our progression here, we're in Genesis 22, not 21, and we're not in Genesis chapter 12. You've got to let go of Lot, and you've got to kick out Ishmael. Ishmael does not go on the altar of sacrifice. Isaac does. What is your Isaac? What is that thing or person or reputation or goal or ideal or dream? What is it or sin that you've harbored in your heart? Maybe it wasn't even originally a sin, but you have taken something like an Isaac and you've elevated him above God. God is supposed to be worshipped with all our heart, soul, and mind, but you've gotten something just a little bit higher than God. Even if it's only a very small bit higher than God, it's an idol. And it becomes an Isaac that needs to be sacrificed. So I want to look at this for just a few minutes here. Notice in verse number 2, sacrificing Isaac is a command, not a choice. We as American Christians, we really don't need church. It's just something we do to kind of feel good about ourselves and those kind of things. Like I mentioned in the previous message, I think after all of this is over, we're really going to appreciate being able to gather together to see our brothers and sisters in Christ face to face, be able to kneel down together and pray, be able to shake a hand without worrying about getting a sickness, and be able to sing together, hear some testimonies. It's going to be more precious. We take it for granted. But for us, it's just like, well, I can just choose to do this, or I can just choose. No, if you're a Christian, a Christian should be like Abraham. When God speaks, you obey. A Christian is a disciple. And so it's not a choice, it's a command. The singleness of this command, there's no other option in the passage. He doesn't go through some things and say, okay, here's choice number one, choice number two, choice number three, good, better, best. Or throw a Romans chapter number 12, good, acceptable, the perfect will of God. If you want to just do the good will of God, you can slide in. You're going to heaven anyway, so just do the very minimum that you need to do as a Christian and you'll still get in. No, that's not even in Abraham's thinking. God says, I want Isaac. Abraham says, okay. The singleness of this command. Notice the strenuousness of this command. This is not an easy thing to do. Salvation's easy. Sacrifice is not. And it's never intended to be easy. The old hymn says, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. It's a command, not a choice. Notice also it's an exercise of faith, not feeling. In Hebrews eleven nineteen, you don't have to turn, I'll read it. The Bible says about Abraham, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Here's what's taking place with Abraham. Abraham has faith that if God tells him to sacrifice Isaac, since he already made the promises that he's going to give Isaac a son and his son, 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 all the way down for all these generations, that if God is telling him to sacrifice him, surely he's just going to raise him up from the dead. After all, wasn't Sarah's womb a dead womb? Wasn't his reproductive powers dead? Did not he receive him from the grave already one time anyway? So he has faith. It's an exercise of faith. This is not about feelings. And I'm telling you, we are an effeminate generation. Nothing against you ladies. Thank God you ladies are sensitive, and you should be, and you have more touchy-feely feelings than us men do. But I'm telling you, this country and this world has become so sensitive to all this junk instead of being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It's all about our own feelings, how we feel about it. Abraham's not even thinking about how he feels. A disciple, a Christian, is like a soldier that says, okay, these are my orders. It really doesn't matter if this inconveniences me. My orders come from headquarters, so whatever he wants me to do, I'm going to do it. He has to battle some sentiments. Notice it's against reason. 
it doesn't make sense. It's not reasonable at first. It doesn't make sense for Abraham to take his son and kill him. Notice it's against reaction. How's Abraham supposed to keep Isaac safe as his protector, as his father, but yet he's sacrificing him? You see, that's where faith and that's where trust are entering into. Oftentimes, like I mentioned in the last message, we don't want to lose that little bit of control we think we have, that little bit of safety net that we have. We think we're balancing things out. And really, when you, when you look at it from God's perspective, He's actually controlling the safety net and keeping everything afloat. You just are deceived into thinking that you are. And in being deceived in thinking that you're controlling things, you're not exercising faith. It's against reason. It's against reaction. It's also against his, quote-unquote, rights. Isn't Abraham his father? Yeah, but it's just like when we have baby dedications. We have the parents come down and we read some verses like 1 Samuel and maybe this. And we talk about the fact that these are parents, but these parents are stewards. They are entrusted with the responsibility that God has given them this child. But the child belongs to God. And the sooner that parents can go ahead and give their children to God and then take their responsibility seriously, the sooner we're going to have better Christian homes and have better outcomes. But parents want to manipulate and they want to control everything. Abraham doesn't have any rights. Faith, F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust him. Faith. It's an exercise of faith, not a feeling. It's a command, not a choice. Number three, this is complete surrender, not partial submission. There's no compromise here. His will is out. There's no convenience. This is not on Abraham's terms. He doesn't say, okay, Abraham, when's a good time? Can you fit it into your calendar? It's kind of good that there's no sports gatherings because you realize you don't have to have all this stuff. Kids can go outside as long as they're not around other people and play and, and step on an acorn on their bare foot and realize it hurts a little bit. And they can get outside and they can be around just their immediate family at this point and realize you don't have to have all this other stuff and then hopefully put God on your calendar every now and again. It's amazing to me we have a certain revival every year, always at a certain time for the past 16 years. And then somebody will say, when is the, the, the revival we have every year? What do you mean? We've been doing the same thing for all these years, and you mean you planned your vacation? You mean you planned your business trip? You mean you planned all this stuff with your kids and this extracurricular activity? We just got to be convinced. As long as church is convenient, it's okay. Maybe with it being pulled away from us for a while, we'll realize we need to be where God wants us to be. And it's not just about being in church on Sunday morning. It's about being at the place of sacrifice. It is not convenient to sacrifice. When God says, okay, that money that's in your wallet, I want you to give it to brother so-and-so. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. Convenience. Well, if I got anything extra, I'll drop it in the plate. Instead of actually purposing in our heart what we want to give according to the Bible and giving cheerfully and saying, how can I participate in the ministries of the church? How can I help these missionaries that are going overseas? Instead, we just wait to the very last minute and, oh, oh, uh, let me see what I got. I got five bucks. I'll throw it in there. Convenience. Everybody wants to serve God in convenience. You know, the night before, I guarantee you, Abraham... I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us this, so I'm not going to throw Abraham under the bus and talk bad of Abraham, but if it were me or you, and I guarantee you some of you parents here, if you had that option, you probably would say, okay, Lord, can we reason this thing out? And Lord, I would willingly lay down my life instead of my child. There are many parents that would die for their children, and rightly so. But God doesn't want Abraham to sacrifice himself. He wants Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And in doing so, he's really getting all of Abraham. It's not really about Isaac at all. It's about Abraham giving himself and his will to God. There's no canceling this thing out. There's no backing out. I mentioned in Samuel there, in baby dedications, we use the passage dealing with Hannah and how she gives Samuel to the Lord. 
And whenever he got old enough and she weaned him, she did not back away from her promise. She brought him and dropped him off and let go and left him. When Moses' parents made that little ark of bulrushes and they put him out there, she made that ark, she trusted God, she put him in there, and she let go. Complete surrender, not partial submission. Many times Christians make commitments instead of surrendering. When you make a commitment, you can kind of sign the dotted line. It's like, okay, I'm going to commit this far, but I'm going to hold this back. When you surrender, you say, okay, God, you got it all. The best thing to do is to hold your hands up and say, all right, Lord, whatever you want. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Now, the testings of life teach us many things. You'll notice here in verse number 8, there's a great revelation in the King James Bible because of the wording. Notice Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. I love how that's worded. It's not just that God will provide a lamb in place of you, but the phrase, how it's worded, is God will provide himself a lamb. In my mind's eye, I go to John the Baptist on the banks of the Jordan River where he pointed that finger and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The testings of life teach us a lot of things, not just about God and His plan, but also a lot of things about our, ourselves. A.W. Tozer said, Abraham had everything, but he possessed nothing. Does your bank account have you or do you have it? Your possessions that you have, do they belong to God? There are two responses from this passage, I believe, that we can take from this. Some of you, you need to understand what true worship is, especially in a time like this. You can worship God even though we can't collectively assemble. And worship is sacrifice. When the lady brought the alabaster box of ointment, it was a year's wage. And she took that box and she busted it and the fragrance went on Christ. And it was sacrifice, spilled out, wasted in the world's eye, in the disciples' eye even. A lot of Christians will look at your sacrifice for Jesus and they'll say, you mean you do all that? You mean you go back to church on Sunday night? You mean you read your Bible? You mean you actually give your money to missionaries? You give money to church? You mean you do without such and such? You don't let your kids participate in such and such? Sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 and 2 Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. To sacrifice to God as a Christian is still a command. And you're never going to get to that place in your Christian life where need to be in your relationship with Him until you come to the place of sacrifice. And it's not letting go of Lot, and it's not kicking out Ishmael. He wants a clean sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, Romans chapter number 12. He says, be not conformed to this world. The world tries to tell you what worship is all about. Holding up your hands, kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. That's not worship. He says, be transformed. That's from the inside out. Not changed from the, being conformed to this world and trying to do what all the churches are doing, trying to do what all the Christians are doing and taking on all of this worldliness, but being transformed by the Bible on the inside changing us. He wanted Isaac, not Ishmael. I read of a missionary lady that she was in India and she came to the Ganges River. And that river's known for, of course, it's a filthy place over there, but that river's known for a place of, of healing. It's a place where they worship their gods and so forth. And this missionary lady came to a, a, uh, a native that was about to sacrifice her baby. 
And it wasn't just that she had a baby that she was going to sacrifice. That's bad enough. There was another baby that she had that was maybe a year older than this baby that had all kind of deformities and was very sick. But the woman had the healthy baby that she was getting ready to sacrifice. And the missionary lady could not help but ask this woman. Of course, she tried to talk to her about Christ and about the fact that she did not need to do this thing, that that's not what God requires and all of that. But she did have to be inquisitive and ask, why are you sacrificing your healthy baby? And she said, we only, the, the, the native lady said, we only give our gods the best. You think about Christians. We often give God the leftovers. The leftover, the leftover time that we have the leftover talents that we have, abilities, work, energy, strength. We use our mouths to talk about all kind of things, get all hung up in politics and sports and hobbies and talk and talk and talk, and we don't talk about Christ. We take our kids and we push them into all these worldly things instead of encouraging them in spiritual things. Instead of putting Jesus Christ first, he gets the leftovers. When you sacrifice, the Lord is going to give you an extra blessing. He does that to Abraham in verse 17. He gives him an additional promise. He says, his seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. He gives advanced revelation, like I mentioned in verse number 8. And Abraham, he gets his son back. God is not one to take human sacrifices. But he wanted to test Abraham to see if he loved him more than he loved his son Isaac. Do you love anything or anyone more than you love God? That's the question that leads us to true worship. And the great thing about it is, of course, he got Isaac back. And Isaac went on to become a great patriarch there's a man lost in the desert, and he comes to this well. And he comes to the well, and immediately he starts trying to pump this water out because he's thirsting to death, and obviously there's no water, and this well is old. But he notices this sealed-up jug of water. Then he realizes what that water's for. And the first reaction is um, he wants to take this water and drink it, but he realizes that the water is for the well to pour down into the well to prime the pump so he then could pump all the water that he wanted. The lesson is you've got to be willing to give it all away before you get anything back. Just a suggestion, maybe in our Christian walk with Christ, the reason we don't have the richness of experience that we should have is because we really haven't been worshiping God in spirit and in truth. We haven't come to the place where we've put Isaac on the altar. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this great text. Lord, what a great lesson in these stages of Abraham's life, letting go of Lot and kicking out Ishmael, the flesh, and then coming to the place where he sacrifices Isaac. Lord, I pray that all of us would realize the depth of our Christian life and how it should be at that place of sacrifice. Lord, we can't worship without sacrifice. We want power and we want revival, but we're not willing to lay everything down. God, I pray that you may convict us of this. Help us to realize this is not a choice. This is a command and we're going to be better off for it. God, I pray that we may take our Isaac and place it on the altar, a holy and acceptable sacrifice to you. We ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.